And we're going to start reading at verse 1. Isaiah 35. And the context of this is Isaiah has been prophesying from the Lord about the judgment on the nations that had uh, fought against and had uh, mishandled Israel and Judah. And he just talked about judgment on Edom. And then he says, Come near you nations to hear and heed you people. Let the earth hear. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Uh, let's move to chapter 35. That was a test of my intelligence. And I failed. Your Bible was written wrong. No, it's, it's, no, it's okay. Chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong. Do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and a road and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool shall not go astray, no lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. With everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This was to be an encouragement. He says, strengthen the weak. Say to those who are fearful hearted, hey, look, your God is coming and he will come to judge all these nations as I have just talked about. And when he comes, not only will he come and judge all the nations, look at what will happen. The blind shall see, the deaf shall hear, the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the, the, tongue of the dumb sing. The stream shall burst forth in the midst of the wilderness. This was all looking to the day of the Messiah, when the Messiah would come. It was to be an encouragement. It was kind of that encouragement of eternal perspective that we were just talking about because Israel was about to go through a very difficult time of judgment because of their sin. So now if you also found your way to Matthew chapter 9, flip over to there. And what we have seen in the context here is Jesus coming back from having gone over to the land of the Gadarenes and healing two men demon-possessed. And then he comes back and the multitudes gather around and they are bringing to him people who are sick and lame, and he's speaking to them or touching them, and they are being healed. And we pick it up in verse 27 of chapter 9 of the Gospel of Matthew. It says, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him. Now, where was he departing from? Well, he had just come from the house of one whose daughter had died, and he raised her from the dead, and now he's coming back either to his own house or to Matthew's house where he had had a dinner with uh, a bunch of sinners and tax collectors. So he's coming back, it says, when he departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he'd come into the house, the blind men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes, saying, 
According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. But when they had departed, they spread the news about him in all of that country. They cried out, Son of David, have mercy on us. Son of David. Well, Jesus was the son of Joseph. He would have been known by that. That was the way your last name was constructed in those days. Jesus would have been Yeshua ben Joseph. I don't know what Joseph is in the Hebrew, but in the Hebrew, Joseph, right? Yeshua, Jesus, ben, son of Joseph. So he wasn't the son of David. They weren't saying his name as anybody would recount his name. They are crying out a messianic title. They are crying out recognizing him to be the Messiah. Or at least acknowledging that some think he's the Messiah. Son of David, have mercy on us. Why would they think that? Well, that Isaiah passage is not the only one that speaks about when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon the Messiah, right? You remember Jesus saying that in, uh, in the synagogue. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And then he talks about healings and deliverance as prophesied in another place of Isaiah. This idea that Jesus wasn't just some magician or some amazing holy man, what became the thought process that started stirring was, well, this must be the Messiah. This is, look, look at what's happening, right? Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, some believe that what is being recounted here is a retelling of a story in Mark and later in uh, Matthew chapter 20 of blind Bartimaeus um, being healed. And mainly it's because of that same term, crying out, Son of David, have mercy on me. But nothing else seems to fit together. It's two, two people, not one person. It's a different point in time, different place. It is two men being healed who are crying out early in Jesus' ministry, recognizing him as the Messiah. And so in their time of need, they're crying out for him. In their time of need, have mercy on us. And so when they come into the house, led into the house, because of course they're blind, they're following Jesus. Somebody must have been leading them to be able to follow Jesus. And they come into the house and Jesus says, do you believe that I can do this? And they say, yes. Or in the old King James, it says, yay, or yeah, yeah. But I doubt it was a yeah, yeah, I believe that. These people are crying out to be healed. They're they are not seeing, but they are hearing all of the stories. And so then Jesus says something that has been so perverted in the last 30 years. According to your faith, let it be done to you. The word there, according to your faith, if you look into the Greek, doesn't mean anything like in proportion to. And that's a heresy of some teachers that, ah, Jesus is saying, according to your faith, so you, if you have more faith, more will be done. If you had enough faith as a blind man, you might be able to be able to see with Coke bottle glasses maybe. But if you had more faith, oh man, you wouldn't need any eye correction. You could, no. It has nothing to do with that. It also has nothing to do with faith being the causative force, the directive force force absolutely not because look how did the healing take place jesus touched them they came in belief and faith has a part in all of this but faith is not the origination faith is that which caused them to keep following and crying out when i'm sure just like with blind bartimaeus people were saying could you keep it down please stop your shouting and Bartimaeus, it says, when they tried to shush him, he cried out even more. He was in need. These men were in need. Faith is part of it, but faith brought them to the place where they came to Jesus. It didn't cause some power to arise that would allow their eyes 
to be healed. Rather, it brought them to Jesus. That's what faith does. It brings us to Jesus, and Jesus does the rest. Absolutely. Jesus touched them. And oh, by the way, that wasn't the only way that Jesus healed blind people. I heard Pastor Joe talking on this uh, passage, Pastor Joe Foch from Calvary, Philadelphia. And uh, he said something I assume is true. I didn't check up on him. Uh, I trust the guy. And he said, if you recount all of the healings in the New Testament uh, that Jesus did, he healed more, more blind people being healed is recounted than any other ailment that people have. Interesting. And there are all different ways that he, that he healed them. In this case, he touched them. In other cases, he spoke. In one case, he spit into their eyes and spit and made mud and squished it into their eyes, right? There wasn't just one way. Because in each case, people needed not just to have their eyeballs be able to see light, but they needed to be touched in the heart. And Jesus reaches into our lives in the way that most adequately and efficiently and powerfully and effectively reaches into our heart. And for these guys, you need to say, well, do you believe that I'll do this? Do you believe I can do this? In one case, Jesus went to the pool of Siloam. You remember it? It's recounted in the Gospel of John. And there were all kinds of people who were sick who would gather around the pool of Siloam. And there was this tradition that when the waters were stirred, there was an angel in the water, and the first one in the water after the water was stirred up would be healed. And Jesus went. He could have healed everybody, but he went up to one particular person. And he said, do you want to be healed? Isn't that kind of a silly thing to say? I mean, I would think anyone who is paralyzed would want to be healed, but even more so, he's there by the pool of Siloam waiting for the water to be stirred up. But his response, instead of, yes, Lord, I want to be healed, was, well, but I have a problem. I can't get into the water fast enough. I don't have anybody here to help me. Kind of implying maybe, well, you know, if someone was here to help me get into the water fast enough, like you, you could get me down there quick enough. Jesus was touching deeper to something in their lives. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Sometimes we grab hold of those things that are familiar, even though they are sinful, even though we know they are not right, but we keep grasping them because it's familiar. We don't want to let go. At least I know this. Do you really want to be healed? Jesus says to these blind guys, do you really believe I can do this? Yes. Yes, they say. Yes, Lord. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly, and that word means sternly. Sternly might not be a strong enough word. He warned them. said, look, don't let anyone know about this see that no one knows it now he didn't always say that but he said that often to people that he healed to the gathering demoniacs he said they wanted to follow him he said no you stay here and you go tell the, all the people where you live the good things that god's done for you but here as with the uh family of the young girl that had just been raised from the dead he said no don't 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 tell anybody he waited till they came into the house to heal them. Could have done it out there in front of the multitudes. Whoa! Right? But instead, no, don't tell anyone. I, I don't exactly know why. I think, to a large extent, he wanted to gather people to himself who genuinely wanted to follow him rather than the sensationalism of it. You know, when you get... Start getting people around something that has some excitement to it. it. It draws more people and more people and more people. But they're drawn to the excitement. They're not drawn to the real essence of what's there. It's a great way to build a church and make it big. If you do really cool things and have really exciting stuff going on and just bam, 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 all these kinds of things going on. 
And I'm not saying every church that has that kind of stuff going is wrong or anything, but it's a great way to get a lot of people going and the buzz comes out. Hey, bitch. But most people come for the excitement. And when the excitement moves to the church across the street, so do the people who are following excitement instead of looking for being ministered to by the Lord Jesus Christ. I think maybe that's why Jesus did it. But here's what I want you to think about this. They didn't do it. Now we can all understand that, right? If you've been blind and you just got miraculously healed, wouldn't you want to let everybody know? Right? So we can understand it, and yet Jesus sternly warned them. What I want you to consider is the fact that these two blind men were willing to follow Jesus. They followed him, crying out for help. They were willing to follow Jesus to have their need, their need met. But they weren't willing to follow him in discipleship or obedience. There's a difference. Oh, when we have a need, we want Jesus to help us. I need to go to a healing service. I need to have all the elders pray for me. Hey, those are good things to do. But what happens afterwards? What happens afterwards when that need is met? Oh, thanks, Jesus. See you next time. That's what happens to a lot of people. As long as my need is met, oh, I'm okay. Jesus becomes Santa Claus. He becomes that one who just kind of takes care of things. Okay, thank you very much. Jesus is not a self-help program. It's not a bag of tricks. He's one to follow. And this guy was, these guys were obviously not willing because they not only didn't follow him anymore, they went out and disobeyed directly what he did. We can understand why they would accept that Jesus sternly told them not to. You see, we can sometimes have empathy and sympathy and understanding for someone who's caught up in some situation that's sinful and go, yeah, I understand. And, and they're going, no, but you, you need to understand, I'm not just trying to rebel against God, I'm just caught up in this situation. And we can say, yeah, I understand that. But it's still sinful, so uh, what you going to do? Will you obey or will you not obey? Verse 32 as they went out, behold, they brought to him a man, mute and demon-possessed. So now he comes out of the house, and they bring to him someone who's demon-possessed and mute. And the word there could mean deaf-mute or just mute. And when the demon was cast out, the mute spoke. And the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never seen like this in Israel. But the Pharisees said, Ah, he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. Interesting that this tells us that some, not all, but some physical ailments are the result of demonic possession. The demon that was possessing this poor soul was keeping him from being able to speak, possibly from being able to hear and speak. But when the demon is cast out, he can speak and everybody's, whoa, I never saw anything like that before. So that's what some are saying. And then the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, it says, saying, nah, it's just doing that by, he's just, it's just demonic trickery. That's all he's doing. Neither one of them are saying like those two blind men were saying, son of David, oh, this must be the Messiah. They're just kind of, well, I don't know, I've never saw that before. Ah, it's demonic. So we move on. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Now that doesn't mean that there were no more diseases or sicknesses in all of Galilee at that time. That means that there was no disease or sickness that Jesus encountered that he tried to heal and was unable to heal. When Jesus sought to heal someone, they were healed. That's the point there. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary, scattered, 
like sheep having no shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus went throughout all of Galilee and he taught in the synagogues and he preached the gospel of the kingdom and he healed every sickness and disease. But his reaction to seeing the people, so he was moved with compassion. This wasn't just a job. This wasn't just an assignment. This wasn't just, well, this is, this is what the Father said I have to do, so this is what I will do. But when he looked out upon the people, it says he was moved with compassion. Now, that's an interesting statement in a couple of different ways. The term there, moved with compassion, means that Jesus is in the passive. In other words, the, 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 the tense of the verb is passive, meaning Jesus was moved. He, di he didn't step into the scene saying, oh, since I am compassionate, I will do this. He was moved with compassion. Seeing the multitudes... Jesus seeing these like sheep without a shepherd, weary and scattered, it affected him. He felt that emotion. As a matter of fact, the word compassionate here, when it's used in the New Testament, most often is used about Jesus, that he was moved with compassion, that he had compassion on someone, some situation. The word also literally uh, it has to do with the bowels. Because you see, in that day and age, they believed that the bowels, not the heart, was the seat of emotions. Have you ever heard the archaic term with bowels of compassion? Well, that's, you know, like a heart. And, and the idea is, you know, Jesus is hit in the gut as he looks at the multitudes. It affects him. We say, Oh, my heart was broken when I saw them. Well, your heart wasn't really broken or you'd be dead on the slab. They'd be burying you, right? Your heart itself is still pumping. But maybe you felt something in the heart. Maybe it began to flutter a little bit quicker or that quick pang. And so we say, oh, my heart was touched. My heart was broken in the same way when you see a situation. People, multitudes scattered, weary, not knowing who to follow or where to go. Oh, you could say, man, it just makes me, it just made me, it, it did something in the pit of my stomach, right? This is affecting Jesus. It's affecting him as he sees the multitudes. Moved with compassion, hit in the gut. It says they were like sheep without a shepherd. It says they were weary. Now, this is an interesting word here because um, in the manuscript evidence, the, there's some uh, who see this as a word which means weary or just worn out. And in some translations, it shows a different Greek word that then is translated harassed. If you look at the uses of the idea, the imagery of sheep without a shepherd in the Old Testament, in some places it has to do with uh, the people being scattered after losing a military commander or a king. Moses prays to God that he would appoint someone to take his place when he moves on, else the people of Israel be like sheep without a shepherd. And Joshua was set in place. And then what did they do? Joshua led them into the land. So this idea of a leader and, and the idea of without the shepherd, the leader, without that, then the troops are scattered and don't exactly know what to do and are uh, in danger from others, right? Now let me tell you something about sheep, which I am not a farmer. Any farmers here? Anybody ever raise sheep? No? Okay. Then you won't know whether I'm telling the truth or not, will you? But I looked it up on a website, so it must be true. <laughs> Believe it or not, called Sheep 101. And I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I'll be able to find some basic, simple stuff about sheep there. And I did. 
Sheep are naturally gatherers in, in flocks. They're, they're, they're not like other animals that have been herded and you have to force them to be. They will naturally go in a flock. They'll naturally go that way. Sheep are um, animals of prey, they call them. In other words, when they are faced with a danger, they don't fight. They run. They don't really have much defense. Some of the wilder mountain goat kind of sheep have horns and stuff, and maybe there will be some fighting. But generally speaking, they run. And so they're scattered. Without a leader, they're scattered. Without a shepherd who's caring for them, they're scattered when there's danger. And then they'll kind of all flock together somewhere else once the danger is gone. They also will follow whoever the sheep is in front of them anywhere. Literally anywhere. And they aren't taught that. They naturally do that. They just... The, the, it's observed that if they're out in a field, stop, and one starts walking away, pretty soon there's a whole line of sheep just walking along, right? And they don't walk in a straight line. They walk in very crooked ways, and, and most think that that's so that they can kind of look back behind them and check out for, you know, some kind of dangerous animal or something. But they'll just follow the one in front of them. And literally, if the first one steps off a cliff to its death, the rest will just follow. There's a YouTube video from a movie about some shepherd that, that actually shows this. You know, not, it's not gross or anything, but it's, it, it, it demonstrates it. Um, it. It's from a, I don't know what movie it's from, it just popped up there. But it was, um, it, it showed that, and, and it's entirely true. My mom used to say, if everybody jumped off the 6th Street Bridge, would you jump off too? And I was like, well, uh, ma, of course not. She was making a very strong point, and, and the sheep will do that. Will do that. So unless the shepherd is leading them well, they will follow the sheep in front of them to destruction. There was an interview I read of a Romanian shepherd uh, by a group that's a missionary group in Romania and uh, asked the shepherd, what's the most important thing uh, that a shepherd needs to have or know or be? And they were expecting, well, the shepherd needs to know where the best uh, grazing area is or the shepherd needs to know where the water sources are. The interesting thing was this old shepherd said instead, the most important thing is that the shepherd loves the sheep. Now our shepherd we know is Jesus, right? The good shepherd. And he describes why he's a good shepherd in the Gospel of John. Because he does love the sheep, unlike someone who's just hired in to take care of them. He loves the sheep and he will lay down his life for the sheep, right? You see, people are a lot like sheep. Yeah, my, my parents told me, if everybody, if all your friends jumped off the 6th Street Bridge, would you? And I said, no, of course not, but I would have. And I did, to a large extent, in the ridiculous things I did in my young life. Why? I'd been told and instructed by parents, by school systems, by others who loved me, no, this is bad for you. But everybody's doing it, right? And the interesting thing about adults is we're just kids with wrinkles, right? We behave the same way. Adults are just as led by the crowd in many, many ways. We don't think we are. We, we imagine that we're not, but in so many ways we are. It's so important to be careful who you're following. If you're just following the sheep butt that's in front of you, the next step might be off the end of the cliff, right? And that's why we choose to follow Jesus. Why we choose to follow Jesus. He says, 
They were weary. They were scattered. And some of the idea of that is in being scattered or, or weary, uh, the word actually means to be flayed, you know, like you uh, cut open an animal. Or weary or thrown down in the sense of not being thrown down by someone else, but being so weary and so worn out of just throwing yourself on the ground. Right? Because they had no shepherd. They didn't know where to go. They were just following the sheep next to them. And when something came that made them feel like they were in danger, they just ran wherever they could to get away from the danger and then wandered around in the wilderness looking for some other sheep. Where do I go now? I need some other sheep. They say some sheep get so upset if they're not with at least four or five other sheep, they won't eat until they find four or five other sheep because they're comfortable and they feel safe and okay, now I can, now I can eat, right? There's a whole lot of people in this world that are sheep without a shepherd. You, as a follower of Jesus Christ, you have a shepherd and he is a good shepherd. And there's a few of us that have been set uh, to be under shepherds, under the great shepherd, to be stewards of his flock. But he is the shepherd, not me. He is. I just work for him. But there are so many in this world who have no shepherd. And so they're just wandering around. They're looking for some flock to be part of. And it could be a flock that will walk them right off the edge of a cliff. It could be a flock that will lead them right into the dangerous places where they have no protection. Nobody's protecting them. So unless they can run fast enough, they will be caught up, consumed, and destroyed. And so Jesus says they were like sheep without a shepherd. But here's the thing. There had been shepherds appointed. There had been shepherds appointed for them. Something had happened to them. The priests the syn in, the syn in the synagogue system, the rabbis, the teachers of the law, they were all to be shepherds. But something had happened. I want you to quickly turn to two places in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 23, and then Ezekiel, which is just a couple books to the right from Jeremiah, Ezekiel 34. Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34. Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 34. Jeremiah 23, and we'll start reading at verse 1. It says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, against the shepherds who feed my people. You've scattered my flock, driven them away, and not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for the evil of your doing, says the Lord. But I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and bring them back to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. I will set up shepherds over them who will feed them and they shall fear no more nor, me di mo nor be dismayed nor shall they be lacking, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming that I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. And this, of course, is speaking of Jesus. And then flipping over to Ezekiel 34. Look at what it says. It says, uh, starting at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the, the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak 
You have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth. And no one was seeking or searching for them. And then it goes on to speak judgment against those shepherds. God had set shepherds over the house of Israel. And they were judged because they had not been shepherding. And he had brought them back into the land and set new shepherds over them. And the same thing was happening. And so Jesus in the Gospels called out woes to the scribes and the Pharisees because they were not feeding the people spiritually. Notice the things that it says in these two passages that the shepherds are not doing or that they are doing wrong. Number one, they fed themselves instead of the sheep. They were taking care of themselves and not worrying about the sheep. They didn't strengthen the weak. They didn't heal the sick. They didn't bind up the broken. They didn't bring back the scattered. They didn't look for those that were lost. They ruled by cruelty and force. They actually participated in driving the sheep away. That's what Jeremiah says. Scattering them and destroying them. You may be saying, yep, pastor, you better keep your act together there, buddy. You better not do any of this stuff. But I would say to you, you are called to be a shepherd too. Oh, maybe not a pastor of a church. Maybe. Maybe not a leader of a Bible study, but maybe. Maybe not in some way of leadership where you are recognized as over a group of people and responsible for them in some way. But maybe, but beyond all that, you are called to be a shepherd. If you have been brought into the fold, you are called to be a shepherd in the sense of doing these very things that these guys did not do. To strengthen the weak, to heal the sick, to bind up the broken, to look for the lost. Aren't those all things that resonate with things that Jesus Christ told us as believers to do? Right? Go out into the highways and byways. Compel them to come. Right? Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to proclaim liberty to the captives. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, that's what we are called to do. Right? You're called to be a shepherd of sorts. Or at least a sheep that knows where the flock is. The flock where people need to be a part of. I'm not talking about necessarily saying, trying to go out there and invite people to Calvary Chapel. Please go ahead, go out there and invite people to come to Calvary Chapel. But we're not trying to build up a, an organization here. That's not the point. The point is to bring them to Jesus, right? To bring them into the fold. To say to them, there is a place where you can be safe. There is a shepherd who will lead you. And his name is Jesus. And he's a good shepherd. And He will lead you beside the still water. He'll take you to the places of rest. In fact, I love the one part of Psalm 23 where it says, In the presence of mine enemies, He prepares a feast. And for years I read that and went, I don't know what that means. And then I got this insight of it. It's like there are all your enemies all lined up and here we are going, I need to run. I need to, I'm a sheep and there are enemies and I know they're going to, I need to run. The Lord's going, no, let's have lunch. In fact, I am going to cook you the best lunch you can imagine because they can't touch you as long as I am here. That's what it is. 
It's Jesus defiantly to our enemies giving us a feast. What a message we have to share with those who have no shepherd. And there are so many who are just sheep wandering alone in the wilderness. They're attached to some flock that's headed towards the cliff. They're weary. They're scattered. They have no shepherd. And we get to let them know that there is a good shepherd. There is a good shepherd who will lead them and feed them. In fact, when Jesus was resurrected, you remember, and he cooked breakfast for the disciples by the Sea of Galilee early in the morning. Wouldn't you like to have that recipe? Over an open fire. Man, the Lord God Almighty cooking you breakfast? That's got to taste good. And he says to Peter, do you remember? He says, Peter, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord. He says, well, then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I do. Then tend to my lambs. Peter, do you really love me? Why do you say that, Lord? You know I do. Then feed my sheep. You see, we're not called to just feed ourselves on the gospel. We're not called to just be here just consuming. Oh, the Lord is so good for me. Oh, Lord, bless me. Oh, Lord, provide for me. Oh, Lord, take care of me. Oh, no, Lord, I'm feeling a little nervous. Please help my nervousness. I see an enemy out there. How do I know you're here? We have what is the greatest message of mankind. The greatest one. The most powerful. The one that in the deepest, darkest recesses of every human being's heart is the cry for this message. The hope that there is such a message. The hope that there is a good shepherd. The hope that there is someone who will not only lead, but will care for, will protect, will fight off the enemy, will lead to the good places, will love, will actually lay down their life for. Everyone is seeking that. And they've been lied to. They've been driven out into the wilderness sometimes by the very ones who stand in pulpits like this who are called to feed them. Instead, they're feeding off of them, gathering the wool for themselves and beating the sheep and scattering them who then say, if that's Christianity, I don't want any part of it. It's a sham. But we have that message to say there is a good shepherd and there is a flock and there is hope. Everyone needs that hope. Jesus says, you know what? He, he, the imagery changes from shepherding to agriculture. And he says, the harvest is plentiful. There are plenty of people who need to hear this message. There are lots of people who are ready to receive it. There just aren't enough workers in the harvest. Pray that the Lord of the harvest send more workers into His harvest. And I love that, that it's His harvest. It's not our harvest. It's not us going, okay, now i got to go out and find a field, and i got to go... No. He directs, and He moves, and He sends us to the right place where we can share the hope that is within us. Don't let yourself fall into that place of just being a consumer of God's goodness. Let it spill out. Let it pour out. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit was all about, right? He said, anyone who thirsts, come to me. And as the Scripture says, out of his innermost being will gush forth torrents of living water. It doesn't just say out of his innermost being will just circulate throughout their body torrents of living water. He knows says, no, it's going to gush forth. 
when the Spirit of God's got a hold of us. We get people wet with the Spirit of God. We start spilling out on top of them. We can't help it. We're not telling them the four spiritual laws to every single person that we have. We don't have a box of tracks going, okay, now let's sit down and read through all this. But boy, the Spirit of God is just pouring forth. And maybe a couple of those tracks would be a really good thing to do. Or there are some people who need to understand the four spiritual laws. I'm not throwing those things away. But I'm saying it becomes just who you are. Not what you do. It's who you are. When you grasp hold of what God has done for you through Christ Jesus, how can you be so selfish to keep it to yourself? Let it spill out. Be a shepherd and let look for sheep that are lost and scattered and weary, worn out, and let them know there is a shepherd that loves them and his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful to know to have had someone who shared with us the truth that there is a good shepherd and his name is Jesus. And Lord, for those of us who have followed you for a number of years, we know that you are indeed good. And you do indeed prepare a feast before us right in front of our enemies, protecting, caring, feeding for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn how and help us to become, as your word says, when filled with the Spirit, we would become witnesses unto you. Lord, help us learn how to be that. Not by some designing scheme, but by being so full of you that we cannot help but share the good news that we know. Help us, Lord, not to become just self-feeders, but let us share this good food that you have given us by your word. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless and keep you, making his face shine upon you, granting you peace, lifting up his countenance upon you and being gracious to you every day of your life. Through Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd, our King and Savior, Redeemer, who is returning for his flock very soon. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.